Hi, uh, my name is Kyle Kaludi. I'm a first year student of uh, the Non-Proliferation and Terrorism Studies, Studies program here. Um, in terms of the potential uh, kind of new order or um, restructure of not only agreeing to the sovereign borders and these kinds of new, maybe more um, specified protocols, uh, would that just be something that the UN uh, would deal with in terms of enforcement? Because I feel like a lot of the kind of problems yeah. that come from, say, the Budapest Memorandum is right. who enforces. Right. So, so the problem, this is, this is a great word, enforcement. Um, a, a related word is consequences, right? Um, the problem with all of these questions, and I, and I deal with, not with your question, but with questions of enforcement and consequences, I deal with this all the time when I'm in Kiev, which I am all the time, um, is there is no satisfying answer. So, so what am I supposed to tell a Ukrainian who says, well, you know, you, America, you've allowed the Budapest Memorandum to be violated. Violated. Enforcement. Consequences. This all implies that there is some exogenous framework, some set of laws, and some cop who enforces those laws that you can turn to. Well, guess what? There isn't. And it certainly is not the United Nations. I mean, that's my personal view. Um, by the way, the United Nations in its original concept was designed to have such a cop. It was going to be basically a joint military staff of all of the superpowers uh, that was going to run the world. Well, that was as absurd an idea then as it is today, and so it didn't happen. Um, so the short answer is uh, there won't be any. Um, but that's not to say that there's no hope, and I think that's why Helsinki is such an interesting example, because given the right incentives, given the recognition that there is, in fact, no, you guys may have heard the term bad enough, best alternative to a negotiated outcome, given that there is no best alternative path, uh, if you agree with that, you may not agree with that. I think a lot of Americans, I think the, the, the bulk of Washington today does not agree. They believe that there's an alternative path to finding a new security consensus in Europe, and that path is contain and isolate Russia as Russia inevitably declines demographically, economically, militarily, and every, and every other way. And eventually there'll be regime change in Russia, whether we are behind it or not, um, and things will get better of their own accord, and we can sort of survive until then, we'll be fine. After all, we've come up with this magical new kind of sanctions that hurt them without hurting us. So, you know, they do believe that there is a better alternative path, but if you if you disagree with that and you think that we are cruising for a bruising now, and we have to undertake something that looks like dialogue, compromise, and concessions that go with that inevitably, um, then the answer is enforcement comes from the self-enforcing nature of a deal which serves both sides well. And that's all in the elegance of how you strike the deal. And the beauty of Helsinki, I mean, it really is an elegant, beautiful, uh, framework. I don't think if we tried to do it today, I don't think we could do it again. I mean, it's that good. And it took five years. So, you know, like most good things, um, is that it, it brings together all of these pieces. It is fully inclusive. The Central Asian states even are represented. Canada is represented. You know, Ireland is represented. And it brings together hard security stuff, like what you're studying in the non-pro world. It brings together environmental security stuff, like what others are studying here. And it brings together human rights, like what we talk about endlessly here in the United States. I mean, can you imagine an agreement that does all of that work being struck today? It clearly will take time. And that's why I say this is a project for the next 10 years. But the enforcement, to answer your question, is going to come from coming up with the right agreement. And then it will have to be self-enforcing. And I would just add a, a final sort of appendix to that. There will be exceptions, right? There are always going to be. So they're going to be your Kosovo's and your Crimea's, hopefully not quite so big and not quite so destructive. The key is to keep them in the realm. There, by the way, there have been exceptions since 1975, you know, between 1975 and 1991, right? I don't know, the Afghan invasion, that was kind of a big exception, right? Um, but the key is to keep them in the realm of exceptions rather than the realm of the new rule. And it seems like if you believe the presidents who I quoted in the beginning, we're now headed in a direction where it looks like that's the new rule instead of exceptions to, to the old world. So uh, does that answer your question? Hi, uh, my name is Julia. I'm also a first semester student in the Non-Proliferation Terrorism Studies Program. Um, we had another governmental expert call. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, here, uh, Michael Kimmich. Oh, no, I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, he suggested that there is a fundamental difference in how the West and Russia view what Eastern Europe is. Yeah. Um, so do you think that inclusion of Russia in European security structures would uh, make Russia you know, be okay with anything other than what Russia views Eastern Europe to be, given the, you know, kind of 
general consensus that Russia is a an extension of Imperial Russia that the Soviet Union was as well. Yep. Um, uh, so great question. Uh, Michael is, is brilliant and it's actually very fortunate to have him uh, inside the State Department now. Um, he's right and you're right uh, that the Russian vision and what I would call kind of the greater Western vision, but in particular, by the way, the, the European vision in the sense of EU, the institutional European vision for this space, and in particular for what sovereignty means in this space, so what a nation's sovereign rights entail. Those two visions are mutually exclusive. So in other words, there's no room in the Russian version for the idea, there really isn't, whatever the Russian leadership may say, and I've heard them say it to my face, there really is no room for the idea that uh, Ukraine could choose to dissociate itself from Russia. There just really isn't, that's not a, that's not a, a viable notion. It just doesn't even compute. Um, but similarly, similarly on the European side, there is no room. There just, there just isn't any space for the idea that there is a greater Russian space, a greater Russian world, or this narrative that Putin tells about Russians being the largest diaspora people in the world, now 25 million people who sort of just found themselves in a diaspora suddenly after 1991. So these are mutually exclusive frameworks. But here's the trick, right? Um, if the alternative that you propose is to say, okay, well, let's just ignore the other guy's framework, that only works insofar as the other guy has no influence whatsoever on the things that you want. And it turns out that's not the case. We are, we are seeing that illustrated before our eyes every single day. And so, so what I find to be absurd about speeches given by high-level American officials, including Mike's boss's boss's boss at the State Department, is in the very same speech, they recognize the reality that we have a different worldview than the Russians about these issues, and that the two are incompatible. And then they say, and Russia needs to do X, Y, and Z. Russia must do these things, which means they also recognize the influence that Russia has over stuff that we care about. So my answer to these, to this apparent conundrum, which is the Russians hold important cards that we don't hold, and therefore we need to get them to agree to put those cards down on the table, at the same time that they don't seem to have any of the incentives that we have for doing that, is that we have to do what people do when they disagree, which is negotiate. And it's almost a universal rule. You never negotiate with someone who shares your world with, ever. I mean, think about it. You don't negotiate you know, to buy or sell a house or a car or a dog with someone who agrees with your position, which is I should get it for free, you know? And you should throw in, you know, the cow with it too. I mean, it's never the case. You always negotiate with someone who's starting on the opposite side of an issue, and you eventually get to something that's mutually beneficial, and that both sides would actually sacrifice <coughs> to defend. And that's where we need to, that, that is where we got to, believe it or not, with, in 1975. And that's why it's so, I encourage you guys, if you haven't read the history of the Helsinki process, you, you need to read it, because it's so shocking that in a context that is sort of eerily similar, though not completely the same as where we are right now, we were nonetheless, I mean, the kinds of arguments that are made, but we can't trust the Russians, so how could we do this with them, right? Or, but they're the ones breaking the rules, so why should we reward that by, by going into a process? I mean, I hear these questions all the time. It's like, yeah, duh, that's exactly why we have to do this. Because other than this sort of containment, isolation, until the Russians self-destruct and go away thing, there's not another alternative. And Helsinki is a great example of how it actually worked, but I can't guarantee that we can do it again. We, we probably can't, actually. But I hope we can try. Great. So I'm Raymond Zaleskis. I direct the Chemical and Biological Weapons Non-Proliferation Program. And uh, I read yesterday that the uh, Russian and U.S. military had come to some sort of agreement to not shoot down its, each other's planes in Syria. Uh, do you think it's going to stay very narrow, or do you think it has any kind of basis for do, getting better and uh, more wider scope agreements? This is a very important question, Ray. I don't know the answer to it. I expressed a hope, as you heard, that Syria could still be one of those spheres where the right kind of cooperation has a kind of salutary contextual effect on the core of the problem, which I still think is you know, the sine qua non of the Ukraine crisis, so getting through it, getting past it, um, and then some of the, the kind of core principles that we have to have on the table. But Syria would be one of those, one, it could be either a wonderful context or a poisonous context. 
my understanding, this isn't mine, this is a friend who's a marine aviator, explain this to me. What we're doing right now, this sort of deconfliction approach, uh, he sort of explained the spectrum runs from deconfliction to actual cooperation. Deconfliction in some ways is a net negative for both sides because all we're really doing is agreeing not to do things that the other side is afraid of. So the Russians won't operate in certain places at certain times and we won't operate in certain places at certain times because we're afraid of each other and don't want to screw something up. And that's, if that's all you can get, it's better than nothing. But it's a net negative because it means that we're doing less than we otherwise could. So cooperation, on the contrary, would be a positive where we agree to positively do things that would actually help the Russians be more effective because we're better at them than they are. And they likewise would agree to do things that would help us because they're better at them, right? So it's the comparative advantage thesis. We're nowhere close to that. But if we're going to cooperate in Syria, I think it has to look like cooperation, deconfliction, which is what we're currently doing. So you'll hear about, you'll hear about discussions between uh, the presidents all the way down to working level officials now, which by the way, the fact that they're talking already good, you'll hear about those things as if those are accomplishments. Yeah, they are, right? But they're these very minimalist accomplishments. And if what we do is we sort of walk away in a huff after that and say, ha, see, we, we convinced those Russians to stay on their side of the damn fence, right? That's not the kind of context setting that I'm hoping for in Syria, but you're very right. That's where we are right now. Thank you so much for such an interesting lecture. Um, <clears throat> my name is Sarah Bidgood, and I am a first year, second semester student in the Nonproliferation and Terrorism Studies program. Um, I wanted to return to a comment that you made in the beginning about the overwhelming disparity of power in yeah. most arenas except for nuclear weapons. Um, as someone who's interested in bilateral arms control, I wondered um, sort of how you saw the process of disarmament playing out <laughs> or, or if you see the process yeah. of disarmament playing out and kind of how that fits into into the narrative that we're talking about. Um, okay, good. Jeff has already left the room, so I'm <laughs> safe. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I think I think that the future for anything, I mean, the, the, the disarmament word is almost like already a bridge too far, but even the future for sort of meaningful arms control or reductions on the margins of any kind, um, other than kind of what you could call like operational unilateral reductions is, is almost non-existent at this point, like the short to medium term future. And the reason is because kind of doing disarmament basically takes two things. One, it takes an underlying, an underlying political commitment to a world either of fewer nuclear weapons or, 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 or no nuclear weapons or what have you, which, you know, I'm not one to deny the, the merits of global zero and the fact that there are prominent Russian voices involved too, but it's pretty clear that we don't have high-level consensus on that between Moscow and Washington, and those are the two key. We, we, we really don't, whatever they may say. Um, so that's missing. And then the second thing you need is you need working trust, right? Because almost all of these things have to happen in a sequenced way that you trust that the other guy, the other guy is not screwing you while you're doing, you know, your steps. Um, and we, we do have obviously technical means, like really creative things that our labs are working on that, that we can do to facilitate very low level working trust. But, but there's such a big gap between where the top leadership is. I mean, I've seen this happen in Washington, as have probably others in the room, where you, know, you could come, you could literally solve every technical objection that anyone would have to taking a particular step that's clearly in both sides' interest, and you bring it to someone who just is, is predetermined mm -hmm. to be against doing something that smells like a concession to the Russians. And it's going to die right there on his desk or her desk. And I know these people. And they're not going anywhere anytime soon because most of them are career people. And they're not, by the way, all old Cold Warriors. We have a whole new kind of middle generation of people who basically hate anything that smells like you know weakness. And they tend to think disarmament and arms control smells like weakness. Mm. Um, my name is Lindsay Smith. I'm a first year student in Russian translation and localization management. And I have a question about um, the Crimea. There were, I think, a couple of maps or encyclopedias that got in hot water recently for printing it as part of Russia. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how, like, if and when you think the West is going to kind of recognize it as part of Russia, because I think we're stuck now, like, yeah. they're not going to give it back, they're pouring money and infrastructure into it, it's just, like, Russians are going there on vacation in, like, hordes, I have friends who've been there, I've seen their selfies on VK, <laughs> so, like, sure. what do you think is going to happen with that, we can't keep pretending like it's not 
part of Russia. They're not just going to like undo it or give it back. Mm, sure, we can. I think we can keep pretending. I mean, <laughs> no, I'm serious. For for half a century, we maintained the um, the legal, political, and moral position that uh, the Soviet Union's occupation of the Baltic states was illegitimate. Therefore, we maintained embassies of the Baltic states in Washington. Um, therefore, we supported the Baltic states. Uh, and th none of this was non-controversial at the time. It was very controversial, but we still did it. Uh, we supported the Baltic states' own domestic political positions in the 1990s, that they represented continuity of government from the 1920s and 30s, not merely post-Soviet new governments, right? Very different, for example, from Central Asia, uh, where new states were being created. And that, by the way, is the origin of the whole controversial citizenship issue in Estonia and Latvia, right? The argument that if you were not a citizen prior to the Soviet Union's occupation in 1939, then you don't automatically get citizenship. You have to take a test, which requires the language knowledge. You know this whole issue, right? And that's why there's discriminatory citizenship between Russian speakers and, and non-Russian speakers. So. Um, it was a controversial policy, but we did it. And we could absolutely do the same with Crimea, and I think we will. I think most likely we will do the same. And it will be, as I say, uh, a point of persistent objection. This is a legal term. What it means is basically you sort of you agree to disagree. The idea is if you if you give up, if you do what you're suggesting uh, or implying might be possible, so you give up your objection, then in international legal terms, the new rule after a certain amount of time simply becomes reality. So uh, you guys may have heard of this concept. This, I'm not advising anyone to do this. It's called adverse possession in property law. So if you occupy a piece of land or a house or something like that, <coughs> and the rightful owner by law on paper of the house knows that you're doing it against his will and he does nothing for a long enough period of time, then by law it becomes your house, right? Squatter's rights is another way of putting it. So, so um, yeah, I don't think we're at all interested in allowing that to be the case on paper in Crimea. Are we interested in doing anything to change it in reality, on the ground? Of course not. That would be insane. So yes, I think that contradiction will, per will persist for a very long time, maybe longer than 50 years this time. Yes, uh, thank you for the very interesting lecture. Uh, sure. Francisco, uh, mm -hmm. first semester MPTS student. Um, well, uh, you talk about proxy wars and the stakes not being too high to to do something about it. You also talk about the overwhelming disparity, and I, I think we also include the Putin perspective of Russia being a global power. Yeah. So at what point or how a proxy war could lead to a new framework of security in Europe? Oh, okay. Um, well, a proxy, so I think we're in a proxy war right now. I think Syria is a proxy war. I think Ukraine is very close to a proxy war, but it's a sort of on and off proxy war. Um, I think it, I think that the everything depends on uh, what happens on the ground in those places. So, for example, if Russia does get pulled into a lot bloodier conflict, and they haven't, as far as we know, they haven't lost a single soldier yet, right? So the, the incentives on the Russian side, as uh, the perceived incentives for doing something to solve that situation are very low, because the situation is actually very advantageous for them right now. On our side, in particular on the European side, we really don't like the situation because it's a giant, gaping, bloody hole that's creating a refugee crisis and on and on and on. Um, if, though, Syria developed in a direction where, as I say, the proxy war element of it became more acute, so, for example, instead of just one alleged violation of NATO airspace by a Russian airplane, you had a lot of accidental or intentional contact between Russian and NATO forces. By the way, this is not fantasy. Uh, in all the Middle Eastern wars, in every single one of those, those wars, there were uh, later later on, after the fact, there were reported contacts between Soviet forces who were often manning air defenses or listening posts or even flying fighter planes against Israeli forces and American forces which had been deployed either in support of or to monitor, uh, in support of the Israelis or to monitor the conflict. That's not at all different from what we're doing right now. I guarantee you that there are American special forces we're, we're training the Free Syrian Army, right? So what do you think? We just train them and just whoop, drop them into Syria? There are American forces there in some, some way or other. I can't prove it to you, right? So the closer we walk to that line where Americans are killing Russians directly or indirectly and vice versa, right, the more the incentive grows to do something about it because that's not a, a good situation for anyone, right? 
the, the beauty of, of the domestic political calculus on the Russian side is it only works as long as they're not actually in a war with America. Because Putin is protecting Russians from a war with America. No Russian wants a war with America. No Russian is sort of spoiling for a fight, like, oh, let's teach those. No, they just want, they want to push back American aggression. So if you get closer to that line, this is the dangerous sort of conundrum that we're in, right? We're not, we don't see high enough stakes. We don't see bad enough risks, even though we're already in proxy conflict. So we, we can look down that road, but we haven't gone down that road yet. And the more we go down that road, maybe the incentives grow, but it's only part of the equation, right? We've got to have all the other pieces. We have to know what the framework is. We have to be politically prepared to have a conversation. So, for example, we have an election coming within a year, right? Or in exactly a year, actually. Um, if in the course of that year, the proxy conflict aspect of Syria or of Ukraine heated up in the direction that I'm talking about, that would provide a lot of incentive to do something. But the election would be a massive break on that incentive. So you have to have an alignment of forces like what we had in the early 1970s to kind of flow all the way through, right? And I, I mentioned, you know, Nixon, Kissinger, etc. I think but for the political situation in Russia, at the Soviet Union at that time, the United States at that time, Europe at that time, and the geopolitical situation, we would never have had a Helsinki. You know, if we had already had Watergate by that point, we would never have had it. I mean, we had it, obviously. But it was at the tail end of the Helsinki process, which had its own momentum at that point. So I think it may be that the timing is all wrong today. So maybe we're looking at 2017. Hi, my name is Pablo uh, Calis. I'm a distant fellow here at CNS. Uh, my question is uh, regarding maybe going uh, back a little bit to the situation of the Baltic states. Yeah. It is because uh, mainly Estonia and Latvia, they have a, a huge percentage of uh, ethnic Russian population. Uh, next, uh, very close to, to, to Russian uh, yeah. important centers of power, like St. Petersburg and everything. Yeah. And w which is uh, an area of core interest of Russia. Uh, what, what do you see in, in this area in particular? Because yeah. um, the Baltic States debate inside NATO and the European Union, yeah. it, it has always been like very hostile to Russia. Yeah. And it has started to be taken into consideration after the Ukrainian crisis in a completely different way. Yeah. So I would like to, to know your appreciation. You know, um, I'll be honest with you, I obviously spend a fair amount of time uh, in uh, the region, mostly in Riga, because this is where a lot of conferences take place. And, but I talk to a lot of Latvians and Estonians, and it's really much more an issue there than, than in uh, Lithuania for reasons of both geography and demography. Uh, and I have to say, and I mean this with respect, I, the Baltic states feel to me, um, to, in Poland to some extent also, like, like the dog that finally caught the car and now doesn't know what to do with it. So they've been making this argument all along, you know, Russia is the, the big threat and the hybrid threat and is going to undermine our territorial integrity. And he's like, okay, well now they have their argument. They have everyone convinced that needs to be convinced in NATO. I mean, so much, I'm actually doing a fellowship at NATO Defense College starting in three weeks. And I, I view my main job upon arriving there as to sort of ask the so what question, now that everyone has come around to agreeing that we have to do something about this, okay, so what, right? And, and that's where things get tricky. Because if you just take the Ukraine hybrid war metaphor and you say, well, that's the threat, that's it. You're completely wrong. That's not the threat to Estonia. Um, and if it were the threat, then, then frankly, I'd tell the Estonians, you deal with it yourself because it's your own darn fault. I mean, the reason that there was a, 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 a credible, feasible hybrid war threat in Crimea is because the Crimean population for 25 years was basically massively anti-Kiev and pro-Russian. And we know that from, from actual historical evidence. I can point tons of articles to you where every time, you know, NATO ships visited Sevastopol Harbor, they would have, you know, thousands of people coming out to protest. They would have store owners spontaneously shutting their doors to NATO sailors. I mean, this was, in terms of what you call battle space, this was a very hostile environment for anyone who wasn't Russian. That is not the case of Eastern Estonia. And actually, I have a colleague, uh, Jill Doherty, uh, former CNN reporter, now uh, kind of uh, council member, just did a paper that I think will be published shortly where she goes in depth to this region, she interviews people, and just shows the degree to which that's just not at all the case. Now, is that to say that they have nothing to worry about? Of course not. They have lots to worry about. Number one, we need to maintain the credibility of NATO's deterrence, right? I don't know that NATO deterrence is credible in that particular theater, that we have particularly credible conventional battle plans 
Um, you know, even I don't want to go down this, this road per se, but some people talk about, you know, limited nuclear deployments, limited nuclear engagement. So I don't know that that's credible. And that needs to be credible. And they're a big part of that. The second part is their political messaging, right? If the political messaging is, you know, Russians are the problem. Rus the Russian world is an illegitimate thing. You know, uh, uh, Russians are a fifth column. I mean, if that's what you get when you interact with Estonians or Latvians, then, then they have a huge problem on their hands because they eventually will create a Crimea-type situation or a Donbass-type situation. And that is something that some Russian leader, whether it's from the Kremlin or it's a sort of local thing, will exploit, of course, because they always do. I mean, that's what people do when they seek power and influence. So my recommendation to them would be now it's time to stop evangelizing us every damn time I interact with a senior Estonian or Latvian uh, or to some extent Pole or Lithuanian, I hear the same story about the Russia threat, the Russia, okay, we get it, Russia threat. Now let's talk about what to do about it. And, and what to do about it is not send the 82nd Airborne, you know, to fight for every centimeter of Estonian territory, because that's never been, I mean, we were prepared to abandon half of Germany during the Cold War. That was, that was part of our strategy for fighting the Soviet Union. So you're not going to get the how to defend Narva scenario. But what you do need is you need credible, conventional, and nuclear deterrence in the region, and you need a political strategy for not turning your own people against you. Hi. Okay. Uh, my name is Sam Meyer. I'm a second year uh, non-proliferation terrorism uh, studies student here. And um, I, I focus more on the Middle East, so I don't really know all that much about Russia. I just I was a little curious about something. You, when you were talking about the differences uh, that you see between uh, the current situation and the Cold War, you mentioned this is a non-ideological conflict for yeah. the most part. Yeah. I've read stuff that uh, that suggests that Putin's Russia has a sort of ideology mm -hmm. in that's you know that it's distinct from the West that they're the sort of the bulwark of Christendom and yep. the core yep. values of Europe, where the, the Western Europe and the United States is morally deviant and decadent and all these things. Mm -hmm. Is this a real thing? Is it uh, is it important? Uh, is it at all ideological, or is it just? You know, rhetoric. Yeah. That is that is a fantastic question. Um, the short answer is, I felt more comfortable saying that little part of the lecture, as I say, several years ago than I do now. I still include it because it's still mostly true. Um, but you're very right. There are elements of ideology. Um, it's it's you know what what in in Russian we would often call kind of the the imitation of ideology at at least. Mm -hmm. Um, but what's funny about it is, unlike in the Soviet period where you could see, you know, and I wrote my, my undergraduate thesis about uh, Khrushchev and his motivations, um, not so much in the thaw, but more in his rollback of Stalin's gulag policies. So he amnestied, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Why did he do it? And part of it was that he was a true believer in communism, actually. He truly believed that he was building something that was going to be real. Um, but then, obviously, as the system consumed itself from within, the inconsistency, the imitation of communism, right, with the sort of physical trappings of it and the red banners and everything, but the reality that you had a totally stratified, you know, almost kind of certainly a kleptocratic system, maybe almost a, a sort of um, caricature of a capitalist system in that sense where you had big bosses and stuff. So um, that kind of hypocrisy is what sort of undid the ideology of the Soviet Union. Ironically, post-Soviet Russia has kind of skipped having any kind of genuine ideology. Remember in the Yeltsin era, there were a whole commissions of really brilliant Russian academicians pulled together to come up with an ideology. Yeltsin really wanted one. They kind of skipped the ideology part. They never really agreed on one and went right to the hypocrisy part. So you have the trappings of an ideology uh, under, under the Putin system. Yes, you do have talk about orthodoxy in the Russian world and Christian values and how we are more, we are more authentically European than the Europeans themselves and all this stuff. And yet, you know, the guys who are putting this forward are constantly caught wearing $100,000 watches that are worth, you know, 50 times their salary and riding around in <coughs> black Mercedes and not giving two poops about the Orthodox Christians who live in their own country. Uh, strangely, they only care about the ones across the borders. And so um, I think when I say there isn't a genuine ideological struggle, what I mean is there, there isn't a genuine ideological struggle. Uh, there are definitely are, you know, forums that smell like ideology in which the broader Russia-US conflict is, is evinced, but I don't think that they're, they're hugely significant. I think they're, they're trappings of the propaganda.
I'd like to ask a question about yeah. Ukraine. What's missing you know, it's, uh, in the discourse here? What uh, don't Americans know? Um, oh. And what they should know about the current political and economic situation? Well, I mean, what's missing is, is genuine knowledge about Ukraine. Like, I, the irony is, it's so funny because, because of the, the remarks that I've just given and my advocacy for trying to find reason to compromise with Moscow, I, I so frequently kind of get attacked by my friends and colleagues in Washington who are like the big Ukraine boosters now. But the irony is they were nowhere to be found five years ago when all I was doing was boosting Ukrainian studies. Because I believe that's what's missing, is no one actually understands Ukraine. What we understand is a theoretical construct of Ukraine as the next Poland, or whatever it is, as sort of the next <coughs> front in the war for democracy against authoritarianism. We have absolutely no concept of what Ukraine itself is, because Americans basically don't take Ukraine seriously, which is actually a really sad and destructive statement if you consider yourself a Ukraine booster, which I do. So what I'd recommend, and I know that it takes investment, and I know that it also takes time, is that, you know, rather than developing a new cadre of sort of new hawk cold warriors to defeat and contain Russia, and we can do a little bit of that, we're going to, it's, it's sort of inevitable, let's develop a cadre of kind of real experts on Ukraine, you know, who are not bought and paid for by any particular oligarch or, or ethnic group within Ukraine, but who are genuine Ukrainianists. And, you know, we should have the capability to do that in places like this uh, and, you know, State Department language training. And But um, it takes a commitment to Ukraine as such that is weird that we have not had. Uh, the, the Peace Corps is an interesting exception to that. The Peace Corps has produced, because Ukraine, thanks to them, they, I credit this to the Ukrainian government over the last 10 years, has been very open to taking American Peace Corps volunteers, that's a really genuine way of engaging with the country. And so we have, and I've hired uh, at least one of them, I think two, in the last five years. We have this wonderful cadre of several hundred Peace Corps, American Peace Corps veterans who have served in Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine and Central Ukraine and Crimea. And so they have, they have real knowledge. A lot of them have left the area studies field, but they always carry that with them. So the Peace Corps is a great example of getting it right. But we don't do that in other in other fields. Mm -hmm. I've had a number of former Ukrainian Peace Corps students in my class. And they're great, it's right? Just really yeah. And just a follow-up question, because so many of my students are here in the audience today, and because we will keep it forever for future yeah. generations yeah. of students. So what's important now in training real experts uh, in Russian affairs, you know, people who not just know the language, yeah. uh, read history, but people yeah. who can operate in the government uh, effectively? Uh, what do our MA students, what do they need to know to be successful? Well, well okay, so here I'll, I'll channel a mutual colleague of ours. Um, in addition, as you say, absolute minimum, you really got to know the language and don't just get by with the language, like really feel comfortable. Because if you don't feel comfortable, then you'll never make friends outside of the limited set of Russians who already speak English, and those are really with all due respect to my English-speaking Russian friends, not, like not really the Russians you want to be talking to exclusively. Um, so that's important, and, and certainly history, culture, et cetera. I mean, I, I myself have to uh, acknowledge the, the huge holes in my kind of Russian cultural education just because I have never been a literature guy, and I cannot ever keep track in Russian or in English of all the characters in Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, and, and just, I get lost after like 10 seconds. But, um, but you got to know as much of that stuff as you can. But then the skills that, that are often missing, and those are, the, those are the door openers, is what I would say. So you're not going to get any job, entry level or otherwise, if you don't have that stuff. Um, I don't hire anyone who's not a genuine regional expert, unless I'm hiring for like an accounting position or something like that. Um, those are the door openers. But then if you want to, to rise in the field, the way that you rise is by having the ancillary skills that are usually not trained in the military, uh, the IC, uh, uh, the, the diplomatic service, and those are management skills. Um, so you need to know how to manage people. It's not like, you know, it's the Dilbert principle, right? Like you're a great software engineer, so you get promoted to the head of your software engineer team and you're a terrible manager. Um, you need to know how to manage people, you need to know how to manage budgets, right? Because, you know, money is, is very important. Ideally, you, know how to, you need to know how to raise money, um, something that most students, you know, don't really do. Uh, but if, even if you do it at a very small scale, you know, like small grants to support student projects, like that's really great to know how to do that stuff. Um, and, you know, I think you need to have a pretty good sense for public speaking and you need to be good at writing 
outside the university and academic context. So you need to be good at writing in a way that boils down, you know, the, the page or page and a half that the person who doesn't have a lot of time, because by definition, important people don't have a lot of time, what do they need to see? What do they need to know? And you can follow it up with more, but um, I get a lot of students who think more is better and more is often worse in, in Washington. I don't know, that's probably not comprehensive, but it's some of the things. Thank you. Yes, it's probably the last question. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Muti. I'm a visiting fellow here. Uh, what do you think are the indications of uh, Ukraine, Russia, U.S. crisis for the Asian states, which Great. still have uh, self-determination issues or border, border issues? That's a really great question. So I just came back a couple weeks ago from back-to-back -back visits to Moscow and Beijing. I also went to Harbin. And I think the biggest problem I see coming for Asia writ large is that um, China is watching and learning, yes. watching and learning from everything that's happening. And what you hear from the Chinese endlessly, and I wish it were true, but I really believe it's not true. I'm not a China expert, but I just don't see how it, how it could be true. What you hear from the Chinese is we're different. We're different, we're different. Let us tell you about you know, Chinese characteristics. So it's sort of, we'll be a great power with Chinese characteristics. And so if you listen, for example, to President Xi's UN speech, while Obama and Putin are literally going at it, one against the other, about Ukraine and spheres of influence and the rules of international law and so on, um, I mean, literally, the two speeches could have been a debate, one with the other. Xi is like, we're bigger than this, we're better than this. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, which is the South China Sea, the East China Sea, and our relationships with all of our neighbors, in which we seek to dominate them bilaterally. We will treat all countries as equals. We will respect the rules of the international order, and we do not seek a sphere of influence. And it's like, look, maybe that's even true now, but it's clearly not going to be true forever, because you are so overwhelmingly more powerful than everyone else, including probably eventually more powerful than the United States. So there will be no one who can check your influence. So then I think the problem is, have we established anything resembling that, that deal, that agreement that I said earlier in response to someone's question, is so much in everyone's interest that it's self-enforcing, or does everything rely upon the American policeman making sure that the Chinese bully or whatever it is, I'm not saying China is a bully, I'm just saying the you know, possible powerful guy on the street doesn't you know, go beyond the rules, right? Because that policemen may not even be there now and certainly won't be there forever. So that's the problem that I see for East Asia. It's, it, yeah, there are all kinds of, you know, sort of more micro problems, regional issues in East Asia that I don't, I don't know much about. Uh, East and Southeast Asia, uh, you know, and, and the United States is a part of that picture. Um, that's the problem I see, and I describe it um, the first time I've ever written about Asia because I feel like I, I kind of had to. I talked about it as a, a new strategic triangle where, um, you know, it's, it's the United States and China, but Russia is the player that's going to seek interest and advantage and, and is going to push and pull, probably in ways that much like during the Cold War will be destructive. That's what I see coming. Thank you very much. Thank you.